no interest for people over 50, to be clear. We're not building this <laughs> for, for my grandparents. Who's going to die alone? It's fine. <laughs> Um, they're much less lonely, ironically, than Gen Z. That, that's because you know, they've got all their friends you know, from when people weren't looking at their phones all the time. Hello, this is Renata Nibel. Hello, Tom. It's great to see you. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me in my wallpaper. So, Renata, let's jump straight in with your wildest prediction. What is the future of love or dating or the whole world? Well, my wild prediction, Tom, is that uh, we will see the slow death of dating apps and even mass social media as we know it, and a triumphant return to people meeting through community and forming close social connections that way. I did not expect that at all. You've caught me quite off guard. I thought you were going to say everyone's going to have a dating app. It's going to be algorithms talking to other algorithms. You know, they'll invite us to a place and then it'll be up to us to perform. Um, what makes you think this? Well, obviously, that's an interesting perspective to have, having previously been the CEO of Tinder. Um, so I ran Tinder for about a year. I was at the company for two years. Now, I think things like dating apps, they may become like uh, eBay. They'll probably always be around in some form or shape. Um, but I think this rise that we've seen towards people mostly meeting online in certain countries, I think that is gradually being reversed. And the reason I think that is um, I've been fortunate to work on apps, uh, products and brands that are really very popular with 18 year olds. Um, uh, and I think this is where we always need to look in terms of the future. If we're going to predict what's going to happen next, we look at people 18 and even younger. Now, they're not allowed to be on dating apps, uh, so you have to kind of get your knowledge in other ways. Um, but a, a huge trend that we've seen the last few years is um, Gen Z in particular, so 18 to 25 year olds, really wanting to meet people organically. And in fact, that's happening increasingly. Um, there have been a few studies recently um, which have shown that um, uh, for the youngest generation now, people between 18 and 25, they, um, they tend to meet people through their uh, group of friends and be friends with them first. And this is a huge shift to how people have met each other for decades, actually, where people may be met at work for the first time, were introduced. Um, uh, there was a study done by uh, Pew, which is a reputable organization recently, which showed that 50% um, of Gen Z women were first friends with someone before they started dating. There was a recent study in Canada, which suggests that for the, the real, like the youngest Gen Z, so really 18 to 20, um, as much as two thirds of people um, at college uh, were first friends with someone before they started dating them. And this is obviously pretty much the opposite of meeting someone on a dating app uh, that you never would have come into contact before. And I think this makes a ton of sense. Like I think dating apps um, were an incredible thing for, um, I'm gonna say my generation, I'm a millennial. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is why I like Wes Anderson wallpaper. <laughs> you got me. Um, we grew up with the magic of the internet and it connecting everyone for the first time. And suddenly you saw all these people online and you maybe wanted to meet some of them. And at the time, it was still a bit unusual for us to just suddenly meet these people online. So there, there needed to be a mechanism to say, OK, I swipe right on you. You swipe right on me. It's OK for this stranger to talk to me now. Like I've invited you into my online personal space. But as the years have gone by, um, one, the, the boundaries between online and offline are increasingly blurring. Um, I, you know, I always said to my team at Tinder, like the real competition, as much as the media likes to make it out this way, was never really between Tinder versus Hinge versus Bumble. Like if someone's actively online dating, they're typically going to be on multiple of these apps at the same time. The real, again, call it competition, but the real trend was more towards people either meeting people anywhere online. You know, we had people, <laughs> we'd see people meeting people for first dates on, on Animal Crossing, uh, uh, on Fortnite, uh, but obviously meeting people through Instagram and things like that. So um, I think people seeing that as a, as a closer proxy to real life. Someone's already friends with my other friends on Instagram. So I'm gonna slide into their DMs as it's called in industry parlance and, and meet someone that way. Um, and now, you know, all of the all of the people that I speak to that are aged 18 to 25, like their biggest dream is to meet someone quote unquote organically. Um, so I think it's an exciting trend. Um, and at the same time, I'm a firm believer that technology can still help people form deep, close relationships. Well, I was gonna uh, say, what's, the, what's the sort of role with, with technology in this? Because in a way there's the kind of, um... There's a sort of lifespan to it, really, which is the kind of the creation of a cohort of people that you might naturally meet. There's a sense it might foster the first outreach. It might help plan the first location that you meet. It might aid spontaneity. Like, do you think the entire process of dating won't have any technology in it at all? 
um, in which case this might be the wrong, wrong podcast. Um, or are you saying there's other parts of the process that technology can help out with? Yeah, so I think technology will still play an enormous role, um, which is why I founded the, the company that I now run called Mino. So I think we'll, we'll move away from these mechanisms of swiping to meet people on the whole, but where I think technology can play an incredibly powerful role is um, educating you on what you're looking for, on where to meet the right people, on understanding things like your attachment style, on how to form deep personal relationships. The work that we're doing at Mino, so uh, we've created a company that uses AI to help people build deeper uh, real life connections. Um, and like I said, importantly, it's, it's friendship, it's romantic, it's with your family, uh, it's all types of relationships. Um, and that's because there is so much that we can learn about forming healthy, close relationships that is currently trapped in books, in tons of podcasts, in the minds of therapists, and most importantly, in our own minds, in our own experience. Like at the moment, there is no lexicon for really what it takes to communicate openly and so on. And so I believe that um, uh, in terms of us actually becoming better communicators, more empathetic and so on, uh, with the help of technology, this is what's going to provide more of like of an operating system to all of the ways in which we'll meet people, both online and offline. Yeah, it sounds very multifaceted in a way. Like, like it sounds like in a way this is a kind of dating solution. It's a kind of loneliness solution. It's an understanding our self solution. Is it all of those things or have you sort of come in through one particular angle? Look, the problem high level that I'm I'm dedicating my entire life to as other people on my team is to combat loneliness. I have been working on social connections in some form or shape for almost two decades. Um, and the great irony is that through my work at Apple, I worked at Headspace and mental health and meditation app and then Tinder. Um, I just continually saw an increase in loneliness. And I think most of us have probably seen the figures, but this is particularly prominent for Gen Z where 83% of them in the US consider themselves lonely either sometimes or all of the time. And I think what's really interesting is, is seeing now the generation of people that built some of those apps moving out to build apps or products that help you return to real life connection. Um, and so for me, loneliness is, is really, it's the greatest battle we'll fight in our lifetime, in addition to the climate crisis. Like these are two real existential problems. If we stop having close friends, being in relationships, having children, et cetera, et cetera, that is an existential <laughs> threat to who we are and, and, and what we'll be. I believe that unless we all come together, even though it's a really hard problem, and meet people where they are, because to be clear, the solution isn't everyone throw your phone out the window. Like that shift has happened. But I believe that we can come together as people, as a society, as innovators, as policymakers. And uh, in particular, leveraging the, the recent changes in, in um, what we can do with AI now and how accessible and affordable it's become um, to make technology good for people again. To what extent is this solving the problem with AI versus solving the problem through introspection versus solving the problem by changing cultural norms or even creating a sort of environment where there may be spaces for people to kind of meet? Because these things feel very complex. Like it, like it feels like there's not one solution to loneliness. And it seems like it's quite easy for these things to be misunderstood. Um, you know, perhaps it's to sort of think that this is an AI that's going to send you tons of messages on dating sites, or it's going to be an AI that sort of tells you the right things to kind of chat someone up. Or like, like it's easy to kind of think of this as quite a superficial solution, I guess. Um, so what's it kind of really about? What's the sort of um, the center of gravity for this in a way? To your point, I do think one of the risks um, that we face today is people um, foregoing real connections, real relationships, real friendships um, in favor of AI companions. And I believe that is a risk that we can and should counteract with something that is more ethically designed. So I'm very lucky that my collaborator, Andrew Ng, who's an AI luminary, he shares this perspective. Um, and the way that we describe our work at Mino is uh, we're more like the rat Remy from Ratatouille. Um, <laughs> so not a, not a fake girlfriend uh, or boyfriend, but instead of helping you make amazing soup, we're teaching you relationship skills. And so what's critical with that is really keeping the focus clearly on you learning about yourself, learning about your relationships and helping you practice empathy and empathetic conversations, a bit like taking a flight simulator before you know, going off into the, the jet plane ride of real social life. 
it is something also where a th it's going to take a village. Um, to your point, one of the reasons that um, uh, there has been this erosion of relationships and even close friendships has been um, a decline in public spaces and things like that. And so I'm I'm thrilled that I'm connected now to a few loneliness researchers um, uh, that are able to provide, provide us with insights on how we can all partner. Um, you know, if we have one piece of the solution that is really this kind of social skills education, um, that also needs to go hand in hand with how people meet in public spaces, um, people feeling uh, like they're in a safe environment where they can meet people safely for the first time. So it's, it's going to take a lot of us to come together to try to tackle this problem. I feel like I've got quite a good idea in my head of, of what it is and what it's like, but I also feel like I might be wrong. Um, so can you sort of take me through what someone a bit like me uh, that you would imagine would have loads of friends and is just constantly sort of batting people away with sticks? How do I use it? Do I use it to sort of, is it a sort of step-by-step -step process where I'm learning more about myself for stage one and then I get like a sort of badge and then I progress on? Um, is it sort of finding um, sort of new ways to understand myself and ask good questions? Um, what's this, what does the sort of onboarding process look like and then the sort of user journey, I guess, from that point onwards? Well, the exciting thing about the way that generative AI now works is that we don't have to follow this prescriptive um, way of channeling someone through, say, a, a learning course or a journey or even like a game because we're able to be much closer to the way human beings think and learn. The generative AI that we're using, working with, is based on natural language processing, which means that we can actually train these models, and they are trained by the way that people actually write and talk and speak and so on in the real world. Um, so to me, instead of us basically having spent the last couple of decades trying to teach people languages <laughs> or these types of things, because that was the way that was easiest for the technology, like this was an easy way to map someone through, say, a website or an app, we can now actually learn from the way that people want to talk and be much more open. So when you come into Mino, um, there's a two minute onboarding where we quickly learn from you, you know, who you are, what you're most passionate about, um, and maybe one particular issue or goal that you have um, that you're really focused on. Um, and then it it's basically a choose your own adventure style thing. Um, uh, and just, you know, like when you're in the app, um, it's really important for us that all of it feels really entertaining and almost fun. Um, so you'll probably see some winks to uh, games like Zelda, there's music, there's animations and things like that. So just to set the scene, you wanted to know the experience. Um, and at this point, one, uh, a lot of it is asking you empathetic questions um, to help you reflect on a particular situation. So if I'm thinking of, uh, well, not you, but um, uh, one of the beta testers currently, his name's Jimmy. He had um, a situation where he wanted to have a, an important conversation with someone in their friendship group. Um, and he said something that I think I've heard from dozens of, of people his age now, which is, well, the thing about, you know, having grown up online is if you say something, it's going to be everywhere straight away if it gets into the wrong hands. Um, and so even practicing that important conversation, but then being able to set boundaries and say, hey, I'm actually quite nervous about this getting onto Snapchat. Um, is this going to be private between us? Seems really simple, but actually getting the language for that and then having the confidence to say that and ask for what you need um, is one of the critical things that we see. And beyond that, um, you'll then get um, summarization. So one of the things that's uh, different with Mino versus, say, using Google or ChatGPT um, to discuss your, your relationship goals um, is that we, we have recall. So over time, we essentially create a map of the things. We're able to sort of show connections. We're able to highlight themes to you. Hey, <laughs> this seems to be something that you're always struggling with on a Tuesday. Um, maybe this is a particular day when you should set aside some time to think and reflect. Like We'll gradually start being able to provide you with um, advice uh, and suggestions. Critically, not solutions, though. You've heard of all of our test users. They, they don't want to be told what to do, but they'd like to have a bit of a menu and then decide for themselves. <laughs> In many ways, it seems wonderful and it seems like a way to give people um, to sort of exercise their minds, you know, almost with like a personal trainer standing by telling them how to use their minds um, and to be thoughtful and to think of good questions and to be really empathetic. And these do seem like these do kind of feel like muscles that can be kind of worked out to some extent. And this seems like a great way to develop them. I mean, there are times with this kind of stuff, and I, I've seen this in many of the, the sort of demonstrations that very 
sort of tech oriented companies have come up with, um, where they've shown no real understanding of the importance of developing these skills for ourselves. You know, I saw one sort of demo where someone was able to get someone to write a, a sort of love letter to their their parents to thank them. And I thought, one, that sort of removes the meaning from the process. And two, that removes our ability to learn these skills, um, to articulate ourselves in that way. And it, it kind of worried me. Um, so is there a way to make sure that these are kind of amplifying our minds rather than creating sort of atrophy almost in how we think about these things? So I think that's one of the most important questions we can be asking ourselves. I think um, this is one of the, the debates that's raging in high schools and so on right now, in particular, when it comes to subjects like maths and English. Um, there have been many calls for students to be blocked from using things like generative AI. Um, and to me, I think the best parallel there is um, when we invented the calculator, uh, we didn't ask people to keep doing everything in their own head. We made uh, the requirements for maths harder. Like we were able to raise the bar significantly for the work that people were doing, even in primary school, by giving them access to these tools and then giving them the chance and making the test something about taking a step up. Um, so one of the ideas that I've heard on this, for example, is, OK, instead of you you know, sitting in a classroom and regurgitating the information on, say, an English book that you've read. Let's have a student write something at home with the help of ChatGPT. But then the work that you do in the classroom is making it better, critiquing it. And I think there is a parallel here. I completely understand why it feels strange and awkward initially to say, well, this, you know, I think it was a, a, a story of someone whose um, wedding speech was, <laughs> was written by ChatGPT. You probably heard the same one. Now, if that person is going to be able to get a starting point and get past writer's block and then change aspects and elements, or if that's the difference between someone never writing a letter to their parents at all and trying it for the first time and then starting a conversation and seeing the impact it has and then building on top of that, to me, that's better than just having no starting point at all. Um, so, yeah, to me, it's a really helpful, again, flight simulator. Um, and again, I can just tell you from the, the people that are testing the app today, even though they're sometimes using it to say practice, sending a text message to their mother who they've been annoyed with, um, and then reflecting on, wow, you know, I feel like she's always annoyed with me, but it turns out if I just took the first step once, she's now, <laughs> she's now much nicer to me. You know, this is where we're going to have a lot to learn, but, um, uh, I, I really believe that with the right design in mind, we can actually improve social connection and communication this way. Are people sort of happy to open up with, to these things? I mean, I remember reading about sort of chatbots and people using them as, as sort of therapists. And I th that shocked me, to be honest. I was, I was quite surprised that people would share information that feels so sort of intimate with something that's not a person. Not so much from a sort of privacy paranoia aspect, although you can see why people might have concerns there. But yeah. are you seeing that people are happier to share things because there's sort of almost less judgment? Um, is there a sort of demographic of people that seem more um, enthusiastic about this kind of approach and others that seem more scared? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what you just called out is one of the main reasons that people get excited to use Mino um, is the lack of judgment. Um, again, in particular for the 18 to 25 year olds, because there is this fear of being judged. There is this fear of being cancelled for saying the wrong thing. Having a place where you can just reflect on your thoughts, where precisely there isn't a human being on the other side that's going to judge them um, uh, or have emotions about anything in particular. That is actually one of the things that they enjoy. One of the reasons that we are focused on Gen Z is we saw uh, an enormous difference in interest when we first started running studies around this work. There's actually more than a 2x delta between 30 plus and 18 to 29 year olds. Um, so when we ran an initial study, 31% um, of them said they would definitely use Mino. 67% of 18 to 20, uh, 29 year olds said they would probably or definitely use Mino. Um, and that number decreases significantly. But all of this is public on our website, by the way, I'm big on transparency. Uh, so you can look up the study there. Interestingly, we saw a slight uptick again in the 40 to 49 year olds age category. My best guess is there that at this point, people really know the value of relationships deeply. A lot of them, uh, a lot of the people in that survey had children. There's a lot more at stake <laughs> with both your family, uh, friendship and, and romantic relationships. No interest for people over 50, to be clear. We're not calling this <laughs> for, for my grandparents. I'm just gonna die alone, it's fine. <laughs> 
Um, well, they're much less lonely, ironically, than Gen Z. That, that's because you know, they've got all their friends from when people weren't looking at their phones all the time. You know, they've got this sort of momentum of of, of reality. Maybe um, is there a difference in the kind of coaching and assistance and um, exercising of, of the mind that you do when people are looking for friendships versus um, sort of companionship versus something that's more of a kind of traditional physical relationship? Is it, is it different? We're pretty early on in building this, um, but at the moment the focus is entirely on um, your real world relationships. Um, so if you try to go into a different direction, Mino simply doesn't support that. You cannot turn Mino into your virtual girlfriend. It, it, the conversations are designed to entirely focus on you reflecting on yourself and real world relationships in your life. I know, as I kind of look towards the, the future, I think quite a lot about how COVID did sort of weird things for our sense of, well, in many ways, it did weird things in our, our sense of sort of space and time to the point where we became quite connected to people who were very far away in ways that we didn't really understand. And I remember talking to quite a lot of young people who'd started their first jobs um, and they'd only ever worked in a virtual environment and done Zooms. And um, when I spoke to them, I, I was saying, that must be terrible. You must be lonely. You must not be learning anything. Like there must be this real sense of, you know, being excited to get into the office because that's when you feel part of something. And the way that they replied made me seem like maybe there was a generational thing, but they talked about their experience as if it was kind of the same as being in real life. And then you see all these sort of films where there's sort of space suits where you can sort of touch people and sort of hug people. Um, and these things become sort of electrical sort of pulses almost. Um, you know, as you look towards the future, do you kind of see the sort of physical relationships and feeling close and feeling intimate, not in a sort of a sexual way, but you know, whether it's a sort of hug of a parent or a feeling of going out with people, do you think that the technology can sort of augment that to the point where they become one and the same? Do you think that will always be a different thing? Um, you know, to what extent do we sort of transcend our sort of physicality in the future or will we always just be sort of cells and spines and muscles and things? I firmly believe that we will always be cells and spines and masses of things. Something I will often say is that it's it's constantly amusing to me how we're always looking at, and this is human nature as well, we're always looking for clever ways to be fitter and healthier, whether it's cryogenic freezing or ice baths and so on. And then we're constantly having these rediscoveries of, oh, guess what? This thing we've been doing for thousands of years turns actually to be <laughs> the thing we should have been doing after all. And one of the things that inspired me to start Mino is there is a growing body of research now to demonstrate that actually the best thing for both our health and happiness is just having a few close relationships. And like I said, that can be friendship or uh, family or, or romantic. Um, but we have developed beautifully over hundreds of years and so when we are in the same room physically as people that we trust our heart rate goes down um, it is literally the best antidote for anxiety of any shape and so if we have a life of this if we have a life where we are living in a community or regularly spending time with people whether that's to your point in the office or with friends and family with people that we trust it's the best predictor of having a longer life, of reduced risk of a whole host of things from uh, cardiac disease to obesity. Um, human connection is a wonder drug. <laughs> and I'm sure that all of these other things and vitamin pills and so on can also play some kind of role. But if you wanna be happy and healthy, just learning how to feel close and learning how to be a good empathetic human being for others that's the best thing. So no, I do not believe that we're going to be hugging each other through spacesuits or telemedicine, et cetera. But you sort of equate that sense of human connection with at least sort of being in the same house as someone. Um, yeah. I, I say this yeah. Out. Again, there's tons of there's studies on this. So um, uh, for example, I'm not worried about the, the marriage rates going down. I am worried about people not being in cohabiting relationships as much. So over the last 30 years, there's been a, a very sharp decline in the rate of marriage. Um, it's not been sort of filled up by people cohabiting. And there are studies to um, support the fact that cohabiting, living with someone, that's actually where you get all of the same uh, benefits in terms of stability and health and so on as as, as being married to someone. I, I, I'm fascinated by this. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a parent myself, but I talk to them quite often. And um, they're always worried about their kids, um, naturally. And they're 
especially terrified about social media and phones as they probably should be. And I spoke to two of them recently. And one of them was really worried because they said their kid had no friends because they never left the house. And the other was overhearing this and said, oh, no, like my, my, my kid's, you know, on Xbox 360 all day long. And he's sort of playing computer games and sort of shouting down the microphone and he's playing with people. You know, they were saying that they thought he'd never had more friends before than before and that they had more friends than anyone else. And it was interesting because the other person realized that's what their, their kids were doing as well, but they didn't think that that was friendship. There was a sort of strong sense that, you know, friendship looks like calling on each other and going to the park and playing football or friendship is sort of drinking cider, um, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a park bench or friendship is going shopping together, you know, and, and quite literally if you went to sort of walmart.com together um, and you were commenting on each other's sort of choice of, of, of shoes or something, that wasn't the same. And I, I am fascinated by the degree to which sort of human nature is malleable to the extent where we may be able to consider that to be companionship and friendship and belonging to something or whether it somehow it becomes different when you can see each other or pat each on the back or something like that. Is there any sort of research or do you have any sort of thoughts on, on that line in a way? Your, your question initially was around can we replace human connection or touching with, with suits and so on. So my answer to that is clearly no. Um, but do I believe that relationships can grow and develop and be maintained through other technologies? Absolutely. And again, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. I was talking to someone whose, whose parents were separated for years at a time, just communicating through letters. And he described them as, you know, the perfect couple and they were still so in love, uh, even in their 80s. Um, we've been able to use technology for these types of things for a long time. But I think, again, I think most of us can relate to this. If you think of the pandemic, for those of us that had the opportunity to work in an office with people before things then moved on to Zoom, that was actually fine. That was like, okay, you know, we're actually a bit more efficient now. This is fine. When it came to one or two years down the line, when in my case, I joined Tinder, I never met any of the people that I worked with face to face um, uh, for over a year. That was very different. And it was like, the curtain went up when I first was able to meet everyone in person. It was funny, actually. So it was my first month as CEO. Things happened to just open up at that time. And we'd organized a, a week of workshops. And we kept on doing the work in like half the time that we'd allocated. And it was just this incredible realization that just by us being in the same room and having post-it notes and whiteboards, things that we had gotten used to taking much longer on Zoom suddenly were really easy and also guess what much more fun like the amount of laughter in the room and just the you know the the little side conversations people were able to have and then quickly bringing that into the room the energy was very very different so i actually think that we as leaders as business leaders we have a tremendous opportunity to create workplaces that are inviting for gen z i just spent this weekend with on friday the former chief science officer at headspace who i met there uh, she's now a friend and advisor. Um, I spent Saturday celebrating uh, the birthday of my former head of core product at Tinder. And I spent Diwali yesterday with my former VP of growth and revenue at Tinder. Like I've met many of my best, closest friends through work. It's a critical, we spend most of our days at work. Um, and so it, it, it does uh, trouble me that a lot of younger people have never seen the magic of this happening. Um, and so it is something I think about a lot, but I think all of us have a great responsibility to not force people back into the office, but really create ways to show the next generation, the magic of being in a workplace and, and physically collaborating with others. This might sound strange, but do you think, uh, the younger generations know what a friendship is in the modern era? You know, there was the sort hmm. of, um, you know, the piece about people being together alone. I think it was Sherry Turkey and this sense that, you know, notifications kind of feel like friendship and being followed kind of feels like friendship and being in a, a sort of group or a, a chat group feels like being in a group. Uh, I wonder sometimes if people kind of almost know how to be and what a friend is, um, what sort of intimacy socially is and vulnerability and, and things like that. Do, do, you, do you think a lot of people need to be trained on this or do you think it comes back to people quite quickly or they're just doing great and, and I'm being patronising? I think that the next generations may may well be, you can't call it better, but more in tune with a lot of this than any previous generations. 
what's really magical is when you speak to Gen Z now is precisely because they, they didn't have any choice. They grew up with the internet. They are so aware and so conscious and so thoughtful. I learned such an incredible amount. Like I spend a lot of my time now on college campuses, giving away donuts to <laughs> have people look at the app and give me advice. Um, and, you know, we're just, we're just a channel for what they're looking for, but they're so, so, so thoughtful and okay being vulnerable. And again, this is even, this is a huge distinction, even compared to um, like people over 35, people over 30 today, where there has just been a stigma attached to um, being vulnerable, to expressing what you need, to reflecting like you were supposed to just be strong or just have a you know stiff upper lip and get on with it. And pretty much every single person, um, like we're focused on the US right now, but pretty much every single person that I tap on the shoulder or that comes up to speak to me on a, on a campus is really open in sharing what makes them anxious, what their goals are, what they're excited about. They think so much about this and there's really no stigma pretty much with that whole generation about working on yourself, about mental health, um, about things like anxiety. So there is a lot of work to be done there, but the reason again that I'm so excited that we're starting with this generation and getting ready for Gen Alpha is because they're ready to do the work, they're excited, and they're so skillful. Like this is a generation that teaches themselves how to do absolutely anything from crocheting to editing kind of cinema level grade things by using YouTube videos. Um, so yeah, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. <laughs> Renato, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on this show. Um, I love people that span the worlds of, of technology um, and people. I love people that kind of get how technology is changing our lives. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of the idea that we need to sort of feel like we're part of something um, and we need to feel close to people. So I love everything about this app. It's, it's finally an application of AI that I can get totally behind. Um, so I just want to say thanks for being on the show and, and thanks for working on this great project. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, it's, um, it's, a very, it's a very big mountain to climb. And to tell you the truth, um, a year and a half ago, I, I was ready to... Uh, to go and work for Disney. So actually the only CV I sent it at the time was, <laughs> I thought maybe I'd go and work at Disneyland and bring joy and happiness to the world in a different way. But it's been incredible to see what the technology is able to do now and um, the types of people that it's bringing together um, to solve something very hard. So thank you so much for having us on the air.